Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Deadly attacks target Iraq pilgrims. Israel claims Hezbollah is storing weapons in Lebanese villages. And Turkey's high court annuls constitutional changes. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. إلى 68 قتيلا وحوالي 150 جريحا وصل عدد ضحايا More than 68 people were killed and nearly 150 others were wounded in a series of attacks on Shiite pilgrims marking the death of Imam Musa Qadim in Baghdad. The attacks come despite the strict security measures taken by the Iraqi authorities. The security forces rushed to the scene of the blast and imposed a curfew in and around the area. The attack took place near the Emma Bridge where nearly 1,000 Shiite pilgrims were killed in 2005 in a stampede that was sparked by a rumor of a bomb in the area. Abdel Latif Omar reports. His finger on the trigger and his eyes are watching for any unusual activities. This is the case of more than 1,000 military officers deployed by the Iraqi government to protect Shiite pilgrims, marking the death of Imam Musa Khadam in Baghdad. What happened yesterday has brought back to memory the incidents that targeted Shiite pilgrims, notably the attack on the Aima Bridge nearly five years ago. In yesterday's attack, a suicide bomber strapped with an explosive belt blew himself up as thousands of visitors were about to cross the main road to the area of Al Khadamiyah. At nightfall, the suicide bomber struck blowing up dozens of Shiite pilgrims and injuring 150 others. Elsewhere in the Iraqi capital, a series of sporadic bombs were detonated, targeting civilians. A bomb targeting the visitors of Imam al-Qasim, peace be upon him, was detonated in the area of al azamiyah The pilgrims came from everywhere. Despite all the terror, the pilgrims are determined to mark this occasion. This is due to their firm belief in the Prophet and his family. The security agencies are here to protect and serve the visitors. God willing, every year, we come here to renew our vows. We will not be intimidated by these attacks. The security agencies, which were able to provide relative security in similar occasions, are being tested in light of yesterday's attacks. This news comes despite the heightened security measures imposed by the security forces. The attacks, which appeared to be politically motivated, may prompt Iraqi politicians to review their security plan. The head of the Iraqi list, Iyad Alawi, and the president of the Iraqi Kurdistan region, Masoud Barzani, discussed the formation of the upcoming government. A source affiliated with the Iraqi alliance said that Alawi, who arrived this morning in Erbil, held a meeting with Barzani over the formation of the next government. The two leaders stressed the importance of reaching a political consensus before the next parliament session convenes. The differences between the factions of the Iraqi National Alliance, or the INA, and their failure to elect a candidate for the post of prime minister may lead to the emergence of a new coalition, bringing the Iraqiya list and the State of Law Coalition, or the SLC, together. If formed, the new coalition may launch efforts to form a new government before the constitutional deadline for the election of the parliament speaker expires on July 13th. Will the parliamentary bloc formed between the INA and the SLC collapse? All possibilities are available as talks between the two sides have hit a new political stalemate, with each side rallying behind its candidate for the Prime Minister's post. The media advisor of the President of the Islamic Supreme Council of Iraq, Bassem al awadi said that the INA has sent a letter to the SLC rejecting its nomination of Nouri al-Maliki for the office of Prime Minister. al awadi added that the INA is still waiting for a response from the SLC. This news comes one week after talks between the two sides broke off. 
Meanwhile, Hadid Malam and Wahel Abdul Latif, two INA leaders, hinted that their coalition with the SLC will likely collapse in the coming days if the latter continues to insist on naming al Maliki for the post of the Prime Minister, adding that the INA would rather join the opposition than play a marginal role in the government. This is what will eventually happen in the absence of a political breakthrough. The deal signed between the INA and the SLC will collapse. If this happens, each side will take a different political route. If the INA senses that its participation in the upcoming government is marginal, it will likely join the opposition and willingly abandon the government. Ali Ladir, an SLC leader, said in a phone interview with Al Rikia Channel that his coalition received a letter from the SLC and it's currently weighing its options. Haider Al Durani and Saeed Al Mutalabi, two senior leaders of the SLC, described the INA request as odd and unreasonable, which further strained the relations between the two sides. In another development, Kamal Al Saidi, an SLC leader, announced that his coalition rejects the election of a compromised candidate for the Prime Minister's post as a possible solution to the government's crisis. Al Saidi said that a compromised candidate will be weak due to the absence of a strong coalition to back him up. We have received the letter which reiterates the position of the INA. The INA has rejected the election of Mr. Al-Maliki. In fact, this constitutes a breach of the SLC's authority, as each bloc is mandated to elect its own candidate. Before rejecting Mr. Al-Maliki, the INA should have presented its own candidate. Based on the mechanism and the terms agreed upon, the INA candidate, whether Dr. Jaffrey or Dr. Adel Abed Al-Mahdi, will compete for the position. All possibilities are available. This expression is being reiterated by most members of the INA, especially in light of their internal differences. Under the given circumstances, it's possible that the upcoming days will bring about a new wave of alliances. The vast majority of the INA believes that their alliance with the SLC will ultimately collapse. Will this end or further complicate the government crisis? The answer to this question is only known by Iraq's major winning blocs. From Baghdad, Mithak Hikmat, Irakia. The Israeli media has revealed that Syria, in cooperation with Iran, has built a factory to produce missiles that can reach all of Israel. At the same time, the Israeli army published images showing what it called evidence that the Lebanese Hezbollah is piling up missiles in towns and villages in southern Lebanon, near the Israeli border. Israel can be reached by missiles made by Iran, transported through Syria and launched from Lebanon. The Israeli Haaretz newspaper implied that Damascus has built a secret factory to make M600 missiles that can precisely hit targets anywhere inside Israel. The newspaper reported on a joint Syrian-Iranian project financed by Tehran. Syria was supposed to produce the weapons and was to be provided with the necessary technological expertise. In exchange, Damascus would send half of the produced missiles to Hezbollah. The smart M600 missiles have a range of 250 to 300 kilometers. They have a 600 millimeter radius and can carry an explosive warhead that can weigh up to half a ton. It is developed based on a relatively old technology, the Iranian Fatah 110 missiles that Hezbollah already has. In addition, according to Israeli documents, Hezbollah has accumulated 40,000 missiles in the past four years and stored them in residential towns, which shows that they use human shields on a large scale. Hundreds of Iranian experts helped Hezbollah build a communication network, dig tunnels, and build fortified underground positions.
وتضم كل وحدة من وحدات حزب الله الذي يقدر عدد حزب الله has 20,000 fighters and each of its units is comprised of 200 to 300 armed men and they are deployed in 160 villages in the Shia dominated areas in southern Lebanon. In some cases they have armed bases only tens of meters away from schools, hospitals and residential areas. بحسب المصادر الإسرائيلية الجيش الإسرائيلي يؤكد أن عناصر حزب الله The Israeli army confirmed that Hezbollah has transformed 100 towns in southern Lebanon into military bases على إمطار إسرائيل بوابل صواريخ من 600 Hezbollah can attack Israel with 600 to 800 missiles a day if new clashes were to erupt خالد الكاشف العربية Joining us now to discuss the Prime Minister's trip to Washington from our Tel Aviv studio is political affairs analyst Dr. Ronan Gisin. Good evening, Dr. Gisin. Good evening. Will there be anything concrete that comes out of the warming of relations between Washington and Jerusalem? Well, first of all, the style is different, and this is uh, definitely a, a, a far outcry from the previous uh, meeting, which was really humiliating to uh, and indicated uh, a collision course between uh, the two sides. I think we have arrived after a year and a half of a sobering experience on both sides that both sides cannot afford a confrontation because of their constituency. Uh, mm -hmm. I think and both sides have Jewish constituency. Obama has his Jewish constituency, which have been alienated by his uh, uh, vote and by his behavior. Toward Towards Israel, and uh, of course, there's an upcoming midterm election. Uh, and uh, Netanyahu has his own constituency, the settlers, his own uh, opposition in the party. So they have to come together and try to find out a way to move the process ahead because both sides agree, I think, today that uh, the political process with a Palestinian uh, has to move forward. Dr. That... Gissin, let me stop you just for a moment. Now, Obama has stated that it is his hope that direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians could begin even before the September moratorium on building in the West Bank ends. Do you think that this is a viable option or simply wishful thinking? Well, I, you know what, uh, you know what, Aaron, I think it's the only option because if they don't start the talks before, it will be very difficult for uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to sell, you know, any kind of new concessions or other uh, confidence-building measures. I think right now this meeting in Washington was a confidence-building measure meeting between Israel and the United States, and I think on that... On that count, it was quite successful. Now the question is, can they move together and, and, and convince the Palestinian side and the Arab countries to start direct negotiations? Because this is the thing that Obama needs. This is what uh, uh, Netanyahu needs. And this is also would be a message to the rest of the Arab world that the United States is not disengaging. The United States is here to stay. And that is very important also for the other uh, mm -hmm. strategic challenges facing both Obama and, uh, and Benjamin Netanyahu which is Iran and global terrorism. Ranan, in your view, does it appear that Israel and the U.S. are now on the same page relating to Iran as well as Israel's blockade of Gaza? Well, I, I think uh, here is the attempt, I would say, to, to come closer together and to coordinate. I think both the moves on, on Iran, which are very critical, and uh, the, the, the strategic cooperation is important, but also the understanding and atmosphere between the two leaders that they're ready to move ahead. And I think Israel has done, and Netanyahu has gone uh, further on the uh, question of Gaza by removing the issue of humanitarian aid or humanitarian crisis uh, from the agenda and therefore enabling the United States to better defend Israel against the delegitimization campaign that is going on in the world. And definitely that's what came up in the uh, four I talks there, that the Israel needs the United States to block, to contain this effort to delegitimize Israel so that uh, Israel can move forward and take those necessary concessions and uh, in order to move the peace process forward. Whether we like it or not, there is linkage here. And the linkage starts, according to Obama, that has not changed. The style has changed, the linkage is not. And the linkage is that the peace process has to be started, has to move, and from there, uh, the, the, uh, the position of the United States, as well as the interests of Israel, are going to be better served in the Middle East.
اتهمت لجنة حقوق الإنسان التابعة للأمم المتحدة في تقرير جديد اتهمت إسرائيل بانتهاكات In a new report, the UN Human Rights Committee has accused Israel of committing serious human rights violations in relation to housing and access to safe drinking water in the Palestinian territories, which according to the report constitute war crimes. The committee will question some Israeli representatives at a hearing in Geneva on July 13th and 14th. قد لا تكون المرة الأولى التي تصدر فيها لجنة حقوق الإنسان التابعة للأمم المتحدة. It might not be the first time that the UN Human Rights Committee issues a report on the condition of Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. However, it's the first time that the committee looks at access to safe drinking water as a human right. يه الصالحة للشرب كحق من حقوق الإنسان. التقرير شارك في إصداره. The UN report was prepared in part by the Center on Housing Rights and Evictions, an international housing rights watchdog based in Geneva, and El Hak. A non-governmental human rights organization based in Ramallah. مقرها في مدينة Ramallah. يقول التقرير إن إسرائيل انتهكت التزاماتها بموجب القانون. The report cited that Israel has violated its commitments to international law by demolishing the homes of Palestinians, forcibly evicting civilians from their homes, and denying Palestinians access to safe drinking water and sanitation. رافق الصرف الصحي. According to the report, nearly 60,000 Palestinians in occupied East Jerusalem are at risk of administrative house demolition due to a lack of proper building permits issued by the occupation authorities. In Gaza, more than 100,000 residents were affected by the 2008 Israeli war, which caused massive destruction of civilian infrastructure, including hospitals, schools, mosques, homes, as well as water and sanitation facilities. The organizations that helped prepare the report have principally accused Israel of denying Palestinians access to safe drinking water and adequate sanitation in the West Bank. They also accused accused Israel of deliberately destroying water resources in the Gaza Strip, which is a blatant violation of international law that strictly prohibits attacks on civilian infrastructure. The additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Convention states that attacking drinking water installations constitutes a crime under the laws of war. The report cites that Israel, which signed a UN human rights document in 1991, will find itself legally bound under the terms of the document. Nassim Ramadan, BBC. BBC. on networking, networking site Twitter has cost a long-time CNN employee her job. Senior CNN Middle East Affairs editor Octavia Nasr was told to pack up her things after praising the late Grand Ayatollah Mohammed Hossein Fadlullah. The decision to fire Nasr came after she showed her respect for Fadlullah in a tweet. Nasr wrote that she was sad to hear of the late cleric's passing and praised him as one of Hezbollah's giants. It didn't take long before she got hit by the consequences of her remarks, though. Shortly after, a written statement on CNN's website said Nas had made an error of judgment. A CNN official said Nas was told to leave because her credibility had been compromised. Nas had worked at the news network for the past two decades. Her dismissal comes exactly a month after veteran White House correspondent Helen Thomas retired after coming under fire over remarks about Israel. Ali Yunus, a Palestinian journalist, joins us now from Beirut to discuss this uh, story. Um, so, Octavia Nas was fired for simply saying she respected uh, the Shia cleric, uh, Grand Ayatollah Muhammad Hussein Fadlullah, who just passed away. He died on Sunday. What do you make of all this? Does her sacking tell us about the U.S. media bi bias? Uh, because, you know, many people are shocked at this. Well, I think the problem that uh, Ms. Nasser has faced that uh, given that the late Ayatollah Muhammad Hussein Fadlullah's uh, uh, perception and image in the United States as a person who uh, had strong ties with the Hezbollah, and we know what Hezbollah classification in the U.S., and uh, praising uh, uh, the person of the late Ayatollah uh, got into Nasrallah, uh, I mean, uh, Octavia Nasser's uh, into trouble. Now, having said that, 
that, that tells me volumes uh, about the credibility and objectivity of the U.S. media, which I believe, as a person uh, in the media and who, who lives in the United States, that the U.S. media is biased when, they, when it comes to the issues of the Middle East, when it comes to the issues of Arabs and Muslims in the United States. And the best example, besides Ms. Nasser, who I, I have worked with uh, at CNN uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, the, the example of Helen Thomas, who have said uh, several things and wa uh, were misinterpreted by the US media and end up in, uh, in sacking of Miss Helen Thomas as well. And th this uh, a sad day for uh, uh, Miss Nasser, who was somebody I respected uh, before, and I still do have a lot of respect for her and for her uh, uh, great work in the journalism in the US. And also for Mrs. Thomas, uh, a nine-year-old who has spent the last 60 years, 60 years of her life uh, working in Washington and uh, the icon of US journalism, and end up, unfortunately, uh, being uh, sacked uh, because of comments she said and were misinterpreted as anti-Israel. Uh, yeah, when it comes to these comments, I mean, why are they so um, controversial? One, uh, talking about Israel, personal comments, personal opinions about the situation there in the Middle East, and this paying some respect to someone who'd passed away. I mean, she really did in the tweets just pick up on some of the things that she thought were positive about uh, Fadlullah. Why are they so controversial? Well, there, those comments were not controversial. We have to understand that, the, that the, the media atmosphere in the United States is solidly behind Israel. There is about 60 to 70 percent uh, U.S. population support Israel. And we, unfortunately, the Arabs and Muslims uh, in the United States and around the world, where we suffer from a bad perception and a bad image in the United States. So, therefore, any commentary that contradicts the general perception in the United States about Israel or about Arabs and Muslims end up being in trouble. That said, as well, the U.S. policy toward Israel and toward the Arab states or the Muslim world also coincides as a, a strong supporter and an un unqualified support for Israel. So comments by Mrs. Nasser violate those tenets and uh, perception in the United States and end up uh, costing her her job. Turkey will hold a national referendum next September on constitutional amendments presented by the government and a majority of parliament. These amendments aim to restructure judicial bodies and subject the military to civilian courts, in addition to increasing personal freedoms and democracy. The decision has, once again, caused debates between what is referred to as the secular powers and the Turkish government. Omar Kashram has the details from Istanbul. The decision did not please anyone in Turkey. The court rejected the secular opposition's request to cancel the constitutional amendment and merely altered some articles that it considered contrary to the principles of the rule of law. It annulled the article related to the nomination and election of its members and the one that was to organize the nomination and appointment of members of the higher council of judges and prosecutors. The government considered the decision politically motivated. It concentrated its protest on the court's overstep its constitutional rights by annulling some of the articles of the constitutional amendment, thus limiting the public's ability to decide its fate. But even with that decision, the government got some of what it wanted. The court ignored the people's will, which was represented by the parliament's decision, and it exceeds its authority. However, even if some articles were annulled, the amendment still accomplishes most of its goals. Judicial bodies, which will be affected the most by the amendment, rush to express their deep disappointment and their fear of future repercussions. We didn't expect this disappointing decision. Nothing has changed. The government will control our institutions to accomplish its goals, which contradicts the government's philosophy. In the coming days, we will see the negative effects. The opposition seemed angrier. They believe that the decision will not impede the efforts of the government to control government institutions and its secular foundation. Their new goal is to convince the public to refuse the constitutional amendment through the referendum. What we wanted was not accomplished. We fear the politicization of the judiciary. We see shadows being cast on Turkey's democracy. Through the referendum, let's vote to refuse the amendments so we can dissipate these dim shadows.
الكرة الآن في ملعب الشعب هكذا قالت محكمة الدستور في The ball is now in the public's court That's what the constitutional court stated in its decision Next September, the Turks will decide on the fate of the constitutional amendments considered by many experts to be a new phase that will have a direct impact on Turkish political life Omar Khashram, Al Jazeera, Ankara In the Ethiopian capital of Addis Ababa, Egyptian Foreign Minister Ahmed Abu Ghais and Minister of International Cooperation Faiza Abu Nada held talks with Ethiopian officials led by Prime Minister Mrs. Sinawi about the bilateral relations between the two countries in all areas and especially in the commercial and investment sectors. They also focused on the Nile River water and on ways to reach an agreement on the disputed issues that are related to the framework agreement for cooperation between the Nile nations, especially after five of those nations signed the agreement in Entebbe, despite Egypt and Sudan's boycotts. In a special interview with Egyptian television, Ethiopian Prime Minister Meliz Zanawi confirmed that the Egyptian-Ethiopian relations are strong. He reiterated that friendship between the two countries must be developed in all areas. El Zanawi also said that Ethiopia will make sure that an agreement is reached in relation to the latest disputes over the framework agreement for cooperation between the Nile nations. The relations between Egypt and Ethiopia are strong. Sometimes there are temporary disputes. But we must keep in mind that these disputes are temporary. We must understand that the Nile's water should not be fought over like a soccer game between Egypt and Sudan on one hand and the rest of the Nile nations on the other. We want to utilize the Nile River water for electricity, and we must reach an agreement that protects Sudan's and Egypt's interests as well as ours. Ethiopia will not win if Egypt and Sudan's interests are harmed. We must reach a solution in which all parties feel like they won. And now moving over to sports news. Singapore has revealed its own oracle, who is also making accurate World Cup predictions, just like Germany's octopus, Paul the Psychic. This time it's a parakeet called Manny. The seven-year-old bird from Malaysia has become a national sensation, having predicted that Holland, Uruguay, Germany and Spain would make it into the semifinals and that Spain would beat Germany. And for the championship title, Manny has picked the Netherlands, and his owner, a fortune teller, has full confidence in the feathered pundit. Though Manny's recent celebrity is due to his football predictions, he has been helping out locals and questions about marriage and fortune for years in Singapore's historic Little India district. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible from support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news. Read our blog. Get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.